Good afternoon. My name is Jay Shamba. I'm the director of the Hamilton Project at Brookings, and I'd like to welcome you to this event, uh, now webcast, How to Lower Healthcare Costs, Competition, Regulation, and Administrative Expenses. First, I'd like to address the obvious. This event was supposed to be an in-person event with a webcast as an additional access point. Um, as of yesterday, the Brookings Institution has suspended large in-person events. Uh, in the words of the president of Brookings, quote, given the escalating nature of COVID-19, we are taking a number of actions aimed at mitigating community spread to employees and our institution. And so with that, we are continuing this event, but as a webcast only event. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I'd also like to thank the people who have come to be with us here at Brookings to be on the panel and then also thank very much the people who are in a studio in Massachusetts who will be part of another panel. And I'd like to ask any forgiveness from you, the audience, if there are any glitches as we try to bounce back and forth between the people here in DC and those in Massachusetts. The Hamilton Project team, most notably Melanie Galarski, our events and outreach manager, and Kristen McIntosh, our managing director, have worked very hard and very quickly, along with a terrific Brookings Tech team, to make sure we can carry on this event. So I'd like to thank them. So as to the event itself, uh, it may seem a little odd to bring together some of the best minds in health economics during a health crisis and not just talk about that crisis. But in many ways, this outbreak has been somewhat revealing to some of the challenges we all know exist in the US healthcare system, those around access, around coverage, and around costs that can make dealing with any kind of health event more challenging. Uh, more broadly, it's clear from the de political debates around healthcare that there are real questions about how to provide healthcare coverage and access to people. But at the same time, the United States has a clear problem with costs in the healthcare system, and we're going to focus on that second piece here today. Um, and in particular, focus on the prices in our healthcare system. And for those of you wondering the difference between costs and price, you could think of the healthcare costs in our system as being something about the how much healthcare we use times the price, whereas the price is just that second piece. Um, we're going to examine why the United States has such high healthcare prices and if something can be done about it. So to accompany this event, we're releasing three policy proposals that you can find on the Hamilton Project website, along with a set of economic facts about the US healthcare system. In that lat latter document, we look at the rising costs of US healthcare, the fact that US healthcare spending has gone from about 5% of GDP to close to 18% of GDP over the last half century. Some of that is natural. As an economy gets richer, you expect to spend more on healthcare, but some of it seems to reflect problems in healthcare markets. Public health expenditures are now almost 25% of overall government health expend of overall government expenditures, uh, which signals a lot of pressure from healthcare on the overall public finance system. We also note that we pay more in total healthcare costs and we pay higher prices than virtually any other country. We also see wide variation in costs and prices both across areas and even within markets. And relevant to the proposals today, administrative costs are quite high and competition seems to be quite low in many aspects of the US healthcare system. So to address these issues, we've assembled a terrific set of authors who have tried to explain how they think we should address these challenges and what changes they would make to the US system uh, to lower healthcare costs. We also have some great panelists who are going to shed some light on these topics as well. So I'd like to close just by thanking the Hamilton Project team. A lot of work goes into these events and into these papers. In particular, I'd like to once again thank Melanie and Kristen. I'd like to thank our outstanding policy director, Ryan Nunn, uh, for all his work, including co-authoring uh, that facts document I mentioned, and also our research analyst, Jenna Parsons, who has played point on this project overall and is also a co-author of that facts document. Um, we would love audience participation. You're obviously not in the room with us, but you can be with us virtually. So if you have any questions, you can tweet them to at Hamilton Proj, and you can also tweet using the hashtag healthcare costs. And we have a team who will be monitoring those two things, and they'll write down any questions you have on an index card and pass them along to the moderators of the panels. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Julie Appleby, who is a senior correspondent with health with Kaiser Health News, who will moderate the next panel where there will be a set of panelists who are all in a studio in Massachusetts. Julie? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. And
Uh, welcome the audience. I'm glad you're participating, even if it's virtual. This is a, a new world for us, but here we are. Uh, I want to start out just by setting the stage for this particular panel discussion. I recently was uh, cleaning out some uh, rooms in my house and came across one of the first stories I ever wrote as a health policy reporter years ago. At the time, hospitals were closing, the number of uninsured was rising, health insurance premiums were going up by double digits. In California, where I lived at the time, there was a county that was looking at how to slow health care costs, particularly for the uninsured and those on government programs. Should priorities be set with some treatments and conditions getting covered and others not? Eventually, the county decided not to do that, saying it didn't want to get involved in overt rationing of care. At the time, the U.S. was spending about $2,000 per capita on health care costs, and national health expenditures were about 11.6% of the GDP. Flash forward to today, health spending is now about $11,000 per person, and its share of GDP is close to 18%. Premium growth for employer plans is certainly not in the double digits, but still, family coverage offered by employers uh, averages more than $20,000 a year. But in the intervening years, we've seen a lot of attempts to slow rising spending and prices. Managed care became dominant, deductibles grew as employers shifted some costs and tried to get workers to have some skin in the game. Tiered and narrow networks have had their moments. Still, prices continue to rise. So the question today is still just as relevant as it was at the start of my career. How to control spending and prices while not stifling quality or access. Today we have three notable health policy experts who will talk with us about regulating prices. While Medicare and Medicaid have set prices for decades, it's rare in the commercial market. Is it time for such regulation and what would it look like? So joining us today we have Lee Moore Daphne, who is a professor of business administration at Harvard Business School. Michael Cherno, who is a professor of healthcare policy at Harvard University Medical School. And Amitabh Chandra, who is a professor of public policy and the director of health policy research at Harvard's Kennedy School. So we welcome the panelists. And I'm going to start with you, Lee Moore. Um, you've done a paper, and I understand that you think the way to address high health care costs and prices is to prohibit the highest of these prices. Can you explain what you have in mind and, and why? Absolutely. Um, and I just want to preface that by thanking uh, the Brookings Institute and uh, particularly Jay Shambaugh and Ryan Nunn for the opportunity to think about this very difficult question. Uh, so to answer your question, let me start by talking about why I think these high health care prices need to be addressed and co-author this proposal with Michael Chernu to my left and with Max Paney um, here at Harvard. Uh, the reason is that in recent years, the growth in health care spending is primarily due to growth in prices. Uh, data from the Healthcare Cost Institute shows that about three quarters of the spending growth for a commercially insured person is due to an increase in prices. And there's no evidence that that increase in prices is associated with improvements in quality. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that higher prices are driven by greater market power and more consolidation in market power is in fact linked with lower quality, not higher quality. Uh, now, competition can work to restrain prices, but so many of our markets are not competitive, uh, and we're seeing some incredibly high prices as a result. So that's the why we go straight for uh, uh, the jugular and we go for prices. We have a proposal to address this that has three prongs. Okay? Prong number one is a cap on prices. Prong number two is a cap on price growth. And prong number three is flexible regulatory oversight. Now I'm going to dive into some of the details uh, and uh, begin with the cap on prices, okay? So we propose a cap on healthcare service prices. So this would be healthcare providers, facilities, as well as practitioners. Um, our cap, we propose that it pertain both to in-network and out-of-network services. And we also propose to base that cap on commercial prices in, in your local market area. Specifically, we suggest that one take a multiple of the 20th percentile of prices for each service in that area and cap prices 
at that multiple. So to give an example, if um, the, the 20th percentile negotiated price for a cesarean section in the San Francisco metro area is around $12,000, we propose that you not be allowed to charge a price that is more than five times that amount. So we're talking more than $60,000 would be prohibited by our proposal. So it's important to note that our caps are really aimed at the most extreme prices, uh, five times the 20th percentile. 20th percentile for inpatient services is around 130% of Medicare. So we're talking very, very high price caps. Um, we also propose, propose a cap on the growth rate of prices. This has the benefit of affecting prices throughout the price distribution, not just at the very top, um, because we believe that something needs to be done about the very steep price growth. Uh, and, uh, and this would operate on all providers, even below the cap. Uh, and it could be set at something as generous as policymakers want uh, to allow for more investment in healthcare if that's what we desire. Um, perhaps something like the consumer price index plus uh, 2%. Uh, and then um, let me move to, move to the third prong, uh, which is flexible regulatory oversight. Now, we could spend some amount of time talking about that, um, but a couple of just important points to note there is that in order to implement these price caps and monitor uh, prices and price growth, we're going to need comprehensive data on commercial uh, insurance claims. So uh, that's a requirement. And then beyond that, we need authorities uh, to be monitoring that data and to react when there is a trigger uh, that suggests that this price regulation is not working as intended, perhaps it's being evaded. Uh, and that would require uh, creation potentially or at least um, appointment of existing state authorities, likely some federal authorities, to do some of this monitoring uh, and assist with the review process when the trigger is tripped. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. There's a lot of moving parts there. We're going to get to some of them. Um, but let me just quickly turn to Michael. Um, you know, this is a pretty heavy-handed regulatory approach. So why do you prefer this to other alternatives? Just briefly, and then we're also going to get to some of these details. But um, why do you prefer this to other approaches? So first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. And uh, thanks to the Brookings folks for having us and um, asking us to look into this question. Let me start before describing the specifics of our proposal by uh, emphasizing one very important part, uh, point. And I think it came up in uh, Jay's intro, it came up in Limor's comments. Um, we believe that we need to act. The problem with rising spending, largely driven by rising prices in the commercial sector, isn't simply an issue of high health care spending in the country. There's a response from employers. They tend to, for example, raise the amount that patients have to pay out of pocket. When that happens, patients don't get needed care. There's a lot of financial burden. So if we don't address this problem, there are actually really uh, real consequences for Americans overall in what they have to pay and how they can access health care. So once you buy into, and everybody might not, but once you buy into the premise that we have to act, there's two broad questions. The first one is how strong should that action be? And the second one is what form should that action take? So with regards to how strong the action should be, you characterized our proposal as a, a heavy-handed regulatory approach, and I appreciate that. It's not the words I would use, but nevertheless, um, I actually think in many ways it's quite weak. I'll explain why in a bit. But when you compare it to many of the alternatives, I think you'll find that what we've done is quite weak. And I would also add that when we talk about some of the specifics, most of them are modifiable in a whole range of ways. You can make our approach weaker or stronger by tweaking aspects of the parameters that we don't have a particular um, uh, strong sense of where they should be. So. Um, now let me turn to the sort of maybe meat of your question, which is why we chose the features we did. Um, essentially, why do we pick this regulatory approach? So um, there are several other alternatives. I can't mention all of them. In fact, when I said several, I really meant an infinite number of other alternatives. So 
One approach, for example, would be to just let competition work and do a number of reforms to promote competition, things like transparency, a number of contractual changes. And I think the panel after ours is going to discuss that, so I encourage everybody to stay around and listen to that. And you should know that uh, neither Lee Moore and I, uh, or Max, I don't mean to speak too much for Max, are really strong pro-regulatory uh, economists. I think we both believe that uh, markets should be allowed to work. It's just the evidence suggests that right now they're not working well. And so we wanted to design a proposal that would allow that type of competition to flourish. But um, in the meantime, because frankly I'm a little skeptical about how impactful that will be, to be able to cut out the most egregious problems. And that's essentially what we're doing with the price caps, count, cutting out the most egregious problems. The second question you might ask is if you believe that competition alone or reforms to competition won't act quick enough or won't be strong enough, why don't you go to a much bolder proposal? And again, there's many other options. The one that probably has gotten the most attention are variants of public option proposals. There's a whole range of those types of proposals. And so I'm going to interpret your question as asking why didn't we just go straight to a public option? And I will tell you um, there are some virtues of a public option we could talk about at some length. But the main issues, I think, um, with the public option are that when one creates a public plan, you could, it actually turns out to be much stronger. You have to pick a price that that public plan is going to pay. If you want that public plan to save any money, the prices have to be lower than the average prices are now. So whereas we have a cap that's loosely, um, you know, well it is five times the 20th percentile in your market, public option proposals are much less. They're often uh, Medicare times 150 percent. That's much, much lower. So you're, whatever you worried about our proposal in terms of its impact on providers, a public option plan would be much stronger and it would in fact raise the prices potentially on, uh, for providers that are underneath that cap. So that ends up becoming a concern. The other problem I think that's important in a public option type model is that um, you you have to worry about stability in the insurance market. So there's many public option proposals that limit who's eligible. Um, only offered on the exchange, for example, only to small businesses, things of that nature, which is okay. The problem is that puts even more pressure on folks not allowed into the public option, so that becomes a problem. And if you make the public option favorable and you make it available to all, you have to worry about broad availability of uh, insurance outside of the public option. Now many people might think that's fine, that would push us much closer to a single payer system and we could have a discussion about that. I think our view was we were not yet ready to say that we should abandon the role of private insurers in the healthcare sector. We wanted to come up with a proposal that enabled competition and private insurers to continue to work on the problem of high healthcare prices and high healthcare spending without having to move to a system where we have much more government involvement and deal with a whole range of other problems that associate with that. Okay, thank you, the Michael. Let, 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 me, let me turn to Amitav for just a second, though. Let, let me, let's jump into what are some of the challenges with this type of proposal uh, in your mind? So I think um, the, the, the challenge is really, there's two challenges. One is, something that Michael spoke about, you know, is the 5x number the right number? So if you make it, you know, 10x, if you make it 10 times the 20th percentile, then you don't do much. And if you make it twice or, you know, 5% uh, uh, of the 20th percentile, now it's going to have a lot of bite. And they don't take a particular stance. I think in the proposal they say, well, we think five times the 20th percentile is the right number. But, and we're not sort of strongly wedded to that 5x number, but I think we have to think about what that multiple of the 20th percentile has to be, right? And here's why we have to think about it. The higher we go, so the, the more we make it, you know, seven times the 20th percentile, the less we'll do. The lower we'll make it, my view is, the more we are likely to cut quality. And let me explain. So I'm very much of the view that when providers consolidate, quality does not go up. So I very much share your view of that fact. But it does not follow that providers who are at five times the 20th percentile are the providers whose quality is not better. That doesn't follow. So high prices 
are not always a consequence of consolidation. They could be a consequence of quality. And when I read your proposal, I noticed again and again you, you, you point to the terrific work that Zach Cooper and Marty Gaynor and John Van Rienen have done on showing the importance of monopoly power in commercial markets. But that same work shows again and again that higher prices are correlated with better quality. So I'm looking at the work you're citing as an example of, gee, higher prices don't reflect better quality. And I'm saying, no, the work you're citing actually says higher prices are correlated with better quality. Maybe that better quality isn't worth it and things like that. Let's give people options. I'm all for that. I'm not saying that markets are working here terrifically well, but I am saying we are going to have quality effects. And the fact that very wealthy people in Boston are willing to pay extra to go to these high price providers is not a sign to me that they were forced to go to these high price providers. It was something about these high providers that drew them to them, which is one reason that these high price providers may actually have a fair bit of monopoly power. It could be that small improvements in quality actually create local monopolies. And so those are all the issues that we have to grapple with. And these are the same issues that, that you know, a public option would have to grapple with. And so again, in summary, it's very much my view, influenced by your work, that more consolidation doesn't mean higher prices. But from that work, it doesn't follow that uh, all the higher prices are a result of higher, more consolidation. Julie, so if we may, Michael and I are debating which of us gets to answer. And I'll, I'll defer to him and, uh, and then chime in if that's yeah, all right. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the issue of quality. So Michael, okay. what, what's your response? Yeah, so a few things. Um, the research on the relationship between price and quality is much less consistent than the way Ahmed Top portrays it. Even Zach's work, and I've actually done some work on Zach, for example, at price differences uh, for selected services and found for commoditized services there was no impact on quality. And I think the key question which Amitabh raises appropriately is what would the impact on quality be if we tried to cut the very top level of prices down? Um, so I believe that the reason why if you thought you needed higher prices to get to better quality, that may well be true. I'm not convinced that that's true when you get to five or six times of where Medicare prices is five times of where the local market is. And much of that work is actually work on spending and quality. And some of the price work, of which there is some, talks about lowering Medicare prices, which is actually moving at a point in the price distribution well below where we're talking about acting. So I suppose one could take the view that we either need to wait to act until we know exactly what's going on, or that we need to be even weaker than our current proposal. That is reasonable. I would argue that if we stick with the status quo and wait for things to play out, the quality problems that we need to worry about are the quality problems that arise by the reactions that will uh, result from where prices are and that overall health would be better if we could control spending because that would reduce a whole number of other things that have much broader health effects than worrying about an organization that's charging, you know, six times Medicare or five times the 20th percentile. And if you were very concerned about Amitabh's point, a few things, you would certainly move away from a public option. And then we could argue, okay, so you don't think it's five, let's go to six. And let's go to six and see. You know, a point I'll add is uh, if these prices have can continue without restraint, that provides an incentive to merge in order to increase price. If, and we know, right, that um, that mergers are followed by price increases, but not by quality improvements. So, if you wanted to try to mitigate or minimize the incentive to engage in these price increasing maneuvers, then saying, okay, at the very very tail end of these, we're going to say stop. Here uh, and it's and, and nobody would deny that there's not a trade-off. Right. There's some sort of trade-off. We don't know exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but sometimes you you uh, say, well, if you can't produce it at five or six times uh, what others can, then and and you know then maybe we're just going to take that. So look, if we knew that yep. at five times or six times the quality yep. was the same, then should we implement your proposal? Absolutely, we should implement your proposal. Right? Like go ahead with it. Like let's just say. 
maybe there's no such difference in amenities and things like that. But in the Cooper work, he's looking at prices. But the Cooper work has an association. It doesn't establish, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but yeah. it doesn't at all establish that an increase in price leads to an increase in quality. No, but he shows. They have a control variable in there that shows that there's a correlate. And, and but it's the evidence you cite. It's the evidence that you cite that, again and again as evidence that higher quality that higher prices don't mean better quality. And I keep saying, because you're pointing to the monopoly part of that paper, but there is this other part of the paper which says that uh, places with higher uh, prices, prices, not spending, are less likely to do very simple things like give their heart attack patients aspirin at the time of arrival or antibiotics within you know one hour of surgery. So these are things that even economists know how to do. So why is it that the places with lower prices are less able to do this? Again, there's a question about whether we're pooling out things at the top end of the distribution or pooling out things in the middle. So a lot of that work is really at a different point in the distribution where we're talking about. So the way that we reconcile, at least I reconcile, the tension between when we see mergers, we don't see quality get better, is because what mergers are doing is pushing you up on price in a different margin of where price is going, whereas um, a lot of the associational work is looking at what's happening at average prices and what's going on, and it's driven by a completely different variation in where prices are. I don't think any of us would disagree that A, quality is important. I think, it, as Amitabh noted, we write about it and we worry about it and what we do, and I think both Lemoore and I would worry about it. The question is really, um, what's the consequence of not acting? So back to how I set this up. If you agree that prices are associated with quality, and you say, therefore, we can't go after revenue at all, that puts you into a whole series of other problems, much of which would relate to quality. So then you say, all right, now we have to do something. What are we going to do? You could take our proposal and say, you know, your proposal's perfect. Just move to six times instead of five times, or some variant of that. Well, no, you could take your proposal, Michael, and say prices are a problem, but you don't have to use the regulatory hammer to fix prices, right? You could give patients choice through some kind of yeah. narrow network or reference pricing and say, if you want to go to the hospital that charges so $60,000. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. So um, I'm a fan yeah. of narrow networks and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and tiered yeah, networks. But that's a very different approach. Right. It is a very different approach, and it's not working. We haven't really tried them. You know what? But it exists, and part of the reason we haven't really tried it is because of all of the market failures that intervene between any individual making a choice and having access to a plan that looks like that because, as you know, it's intermediated through our employers. So, so as I, I want us, in fact, to be in a world where we have more agency over our insurance right. plans and have greater choice over right. health plans. Right. But that's not the world we're in. So rather than continue to write about the yeah. world I wish there were, I'm out there saying, you know what, given the world that we're in and the harm that is arising and the incentives this is creating, it is too broken to keep talking about the world I wish that yeah. there were. And, and to make this not so much a bunch of Harvard economists talk, <laughs> talking to each other, I will add, there is work that's been done on reference pricing. Two things about the, the best work, I think, is uh, Jamie Robinson and Chris Whaley have done some. They find a few things. One is they find big effects both on where people go get care and they find a, a price effect and they find no quality change, by the way, when the price went down in that particular work. Um, and then Ativ Narotra and Anna Sinenko, two other colleagues of ours, did some work that explained why those types of models don't diffuse. So it is the case, and again, I encourage everybody to stay for Marty's panel. That will, you know, we should have had Marty here. Unfortunately, he's not in Boston now. Um, to look at the, the uh, type of pro-competitive things that Amitabh's discussing, all of which I think Lemore and I would agree with and be supportive of, the question is, should we continue to sit back and let the world evolve and hope that all of that works, or should we take some action now? I think Amitabh, in some ways, is arguing that our proposal is too strong, uh, which is a reasonable view, and I hope that everybody who thinks it's too weak listens to Amitabh. Um, <laughs> I, I've heard from a number of others, uh, particularly that fans of public option yeah. and other types of proposals, that our proposal is way too strong. So it is the case that we are, to some extent, a middle ground, and weak. you can titrate. We've designed it to both be titratable, to be modifiable, and to give room for the pro-competitive things that Amitab talks about to take hold. But what we haven't done is taken the view that we should wait and see how things play out. Could and I, could I, could I worry, uh, yeah, go on. So I've got a question. This is, this is a great, robust discussion, and I'm going to encourage the audience again to, to tweet in your questions, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But, but explain how would this go into effect? Is this going to require some kind of um, 
legislation, or how, how would this be implemented? I mean, there, there's a, a whole range of implementation details, and I don't want to trivialize them by calling it that. It, we, we fully recognize that this is a big picture proposal, and we have sketched out, it's available now online in the proposal, some of the uh, implementation uh, requirements, but it's certainly not drafted in a way that is, you know, ready to go legislative language. Uh, that said, uh, there are a couple things that, that we know will require. We're going to require comprehensive data, otherwise we can't even monitor what's happening to prices. That's a problem already uh, today for researchers and for, for policymakers. That would likely require federal action to ensure that employers who self-insure their health plans that their claims are included when uh, insurers are mandated to submit them to, to uh, state or federal agencies. So there's probably federal legislation that would be required for us to get a reasonable sample, a representative sample of, of claims data. Second is that uh, the states have, have uh, a lot of infrastructure. Uh, that engages in, um, in monitoring of the healthcare system. There are departments of insurance, there are departments of health. Uh, now these departments would be asked to do some monitoring, uh, and I think at state option, they can decide how aggressively they want to, uh, if they want to have the caps, how aggressive they should be, and how extensive the monitoring ought to be, but one would need to have authorities who are tasked with doing that uh, and uh, given a budget. So those are, I think, the, the key components. And would these be caps on what hospitals can charge or what insurers could pay, or both? Ultimately, both. Uh, uh, whatever is most expedient and effective for, uh, for the legislators in the given area uh, to, uh, to establish. In, in a state-based system, there's limits on what insurers can be regulated through a program called a, a law called ERISA. So you have to focus on that. And much of the enforcement mechanisms that we've looked at, and even the growth stuff, has been tried. The, the growth caps have been tried in Rhode Island, a variant of them. Massachusetts has a version of the uh, flexible regulatory oversight that's a little bit weaker than what we're proposing, but it's been done. David Cutler is coming to speak next. He's actually on the Health Policy Commission that implements that. Um, and by moving this away from a connection to Medicare, which is another point worth discussing, but by not connecting it to Medicare, we've uh, removed some of the other challenges that we think might otherwise have arisen. Of course, we've created different challenges. So on the top, I'm, I'm interested in this issue of price transparency and, and um, market forces. So there's a move um, the Trump administration has to, made to require hospitals to post their negotiated prices for services and for insurers to provide consumers with better tools to figure out what it might cost them to see a doctor or have surgery or whatever. Um, court battles are expected over this, but let's say it goes into effect and they have to post their negotiated prices. Would that mean we wouldn't need a proposal like Lemore and Michael are, are putting here because the prices would be transparent, people could decide where to shop, employers could decide which providers to sign on with, that type of thing, or would that not help resolve some of these issues? So I wish that, you know, shopping for hospital care was like shopping for cars and computers, and if we just posted the prices, people would go and shop. My strong sense is that to the extent that um, there will be some shopping that happens, it probably will not be led by patients. But there are two other groups who might respond to that data on negotiated prices. So one, as you said, employers might respond. They might find it a little bit easier to build that narrow network, right? Yeah. So certainly it's not gonna be harder to build a narrow network. But second, I think that a lot of Mike's earlier work um, on what happens when you capitate physician groups, in a sense. That could be a mechanism by which we lower the cost of healthcare. So if a physician group, you know, if a physician-led ACL was receiving a fixed amount of money to take care of a pool of patients, and they knew that it was six times more expensive to send a patient to a particular large marquee academic medical center in Boston as opposed to you know, another hospital that's six times cheaper, they would have a strong incentive to refer their patients to the cheaper hospital that's just as good, but they wouldn't know that without better data on what they would pay if the patient went to the expensive hospital versus the cheaper hospital that's just as good. So I think, I think these ideas can help. I'm not convinced that the 
the agent here will be the patient. I'm a lot more, you know, I, I updated a lot from Mike's earlier work on the AQC in Massachusetts. And when I read that work, I thought the takeaway was very much that the agents here could be physicians. And I think the untapped agent are the ERISA plans themselves. So employers could really look at the variation and say maybe we'll build a narrow network in, in Boston or we'll build a narrow network in Washington, D.C. or Chicago or San Francisco where we let you go to the really expensive hospital, but only for the following three things. And for everything else, you go to these other hospitals. And if you want to go to the really expensive hospital, you can go, but then you are top, you know, you're paying that extra very high co-insurance rate. Amitab's being a little modest. He's done some of the seminal work on how these consumer-directed health plans that were intended to allow people to shop actually didn't get them to mm -hmm. shop. It did get them to use less care, suggesting if you just charge them more because prices are going up, they use less care. They certainly don't shop. The bit about uh, payment reform and controlling spending I do think is very important. We can have another discussion mm -hmm. about that. I'm a little less optimistic about the idea that insurers and, use, and employers need to use the data. Uh, someone who serves on the Harvard Benefits Committee actually with Lamore as well. We actually might, we know what the negotiated rates are. We don't need to have them posted and mandated to be have posted. We know what they are because we have carriers that can tell us. So if we wanted to do a narrow network or a reference for pricing plan, there's more than enough information out there now for us to do them. We're actually not quite ready to do that. And I'll jump in and say that Michael is being modest together with Zach Cooper. He's done some recent work on price shopping um, by consumers, uh, but also by informed referring providers and doesn't find any evidence that the referring providers are um, directing uh, their imaging and whatnot to the lower cost facilities. Because they didn't have the incentives on what I was talking about. Yeah. Because, uh, because there, there's a lack of incentives. Yes. Yeah. But so we can fix the incentives problem, I think, through these physician, yeah. you know, lead uh, ACOs, right? That, that would be an idea. And what we would say is we would say this sort of initiative, which is part of the gainer proposal, more price transparency, yeah. although I do have some concerns uh, about the possibility that it can lead to collusion over prices, um, can be beneficial. Uh, and we hope that that movement accelerates. We just don't want to wait that long. Uh, in the hopes and not try to curb some of the serious abuses, this would address a lot of the surprise billing problems, right? Yeah, so but there's other ways I can deal with surprise billing. You could. Yeah, uh, without it, this. You could. Right? You could. So the worry for me is just that, not it's, that a big, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big worry that, like, look, you're being very modest and you're saying, I'm going to use a multiple like five times the 20th yeah. percentile. To really give this teeth, most employers are going to say, I'm going to use a multiple like two. Most legislators are going to say, I'm going to use a multiple like two. And then these quality effects become first order. Yes. You know, let, let, let's, see it, <laughs> let's see it happen, right? Well, and I would say in the surprise billing case, the reason why we have not been able to get the good surprise billing legislation in part is because people have made arguments like, well, this top end, there is going to be some quality effect for whatever reason, and therefore we can't go forward. There is, it's really a continuum of argumentation where first you have to decide whether you have to act. I think if we were having a discussion about the surprise billing, you would say we have to do something, and you would pick something that would lower the price in those places, and then someone could say, well, there might be some quality effects, maybe. I very, 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 very but, much But this is it. a different problem, just to be clear, than surprise billing. Yeah, this yeah. is very much a cesarean in San Francisco might cost $60,000. $60, right. That's not surprise billing. No, it's really the so you're saying it there's a really risk that that is a really, really good thesis. But, but the problem, if the problem were just the Or there's amenities that are really important to that's people. That's right. right. And we're saying there's, there's... And you're saying that amenities aren't important. In, no, I'm saying there's insufficient consumer agency to walk where you're willing to pay. And, and or, I, right, with, com combined with the moral hazard and the employer selecting the insurance plan, I might not want to have so many people going to the Or the facility. employers are getting it right. They're acutely aware of what their employees want. There's empirical and evidence the that they are not want, getting No, it but right. employees may want access some to these might. expensive places. Exactly. So yeah. some, might, some might. And they're willing to spend that. And, and other people are not. When and you so get individuals on exchanges, you see they are not willing to exactly. spend breadth over price. Because they're lower income. What they're, I'm saying. They're, they're much lower income and they don't want to pay those very high prices. Again, if we were in a universe where we all got to pick our health plan, I probably wouldn't be here saying this. We just aren't. 
I think the one thing I want to say about this discussion, which is important because we talked about C-sections in San Francisco, is there's a sense in which you might think from a comment like that that, well, San Francisco is just very expensive. It is. The, I, it is. The reason why our model is tied to the 20th percentile of prices in a market is the San Francisco effect. If San Francisco were truly an expensive place, the, our cap would actually be higher. And so we allow for some of that variation. It is true that when we lop off the top end of prices, we are lopping off two things. We are lopping off a portion of market power, which we all agree should be lopped off, and we're lopping off a portion of what we might call valid, justifiable, whatever, uh, whatever variation in price. That's true, There'd be, right? I think I would argue that when you get to the range we're talking about, you're well above that sort of variation for producing a high quality uh, C-section, but maybe I'm wrong in one way, okay, I've been wrong about a lot of things in my life, um, but what I would say is it's simply a risk I'm willing to take given what else is going on in the system. So let's and let's so talk I'm let's talk about those let's talk about those that cap because a lot of employers like Amata said might look at that and say that's a still a really high range so why not tie it to a multiple of Medicare perhaps as we saw in Montana where the state employees program went around and said you know what we're going to pay a little over two times Medicare and they eventually with some arm twisting got all the hospitals to sign on uh, your proposal would seem to be locking in at higher prices than that. So explain why you so, haven't based so, yours on Medicare. Right. I mean, we, we, we are, uh, as economists, uh, want to try to rely on our markets to work. Where they don't work, we want to promote competition. We want to uh, cut off this top end. We aren't proposing administered prices and tying our commercial prices to Medicare prices for a number of reasons. Uh, then we have to rely on the government to define the units of price. We have to rely on the relative prices, and it's well known that Medicare gets a lot of those wrong, if you will. Uh, and uh, if we just set our caps, we still, and they're based on commercial prices, we're allowing to some degree market forces to influence what those, what those prices are. We also have, uh, we uh, avoid exposing this regulation to all of the political issues surrounding Medicare. Because if Medicare prices um, formulaically cap commercial prices, now any debate over anything that happens in Medicare uh, becomes multiplied, leading potentially to even worse uh, gridlock than, than we currently have. Competition and whether or not competition is going to help uh, constrain prices. Would this proposal be adopted sort of universally or should it just be in markets where the market's not working? Anybody want to take on that question? Uh, I mean, I, I'll take it on uh, if, if I might. So the way that our proposal is designed, we could have done something different. We could have said the top, uh, the 90th percentile price in every market, that's the maximum. Uh, that is not what we did. It, that, if you tried that proposal, you can see in our paper, it ends up saving just a little bit less than what we do, okay? Um, but we didn't do that. We don't say that all markets must necessarily have prices that are strongly indicative of, of market failure. What we say is, because the 20th percentile of prices is not nearly as, as uh, spread out, there isn't as much variation in that as there is in, say, the 90th percentile, where you see some real extremes in lots of markets, uh, largely due to uh, provider and insurer market power, then we, we say if you are you know, five times that more than that, then we're going to say that is a, an outlier in terms of, of uh, what's going on with your prices. We lop, we lop those. Uh, so that would mean that in some markets, you aren't affected. For example, we've done some simulations for inpatient uh, facilities and services and outpatient. We find that the effect on outpatient physicians is much smaller because guess what? There aren't nearly as many providers that are charging five times uh, the 20th percentile in their market, so they would be less affected. What do you do about markets, rural markets, where uh, you don't have the price variation, yeah. but you have a large system. Yeah. So you don't have the 20th percentile. That's There's right. essentially one payer. That payer has some monopoly power. We now we want to think now we see now someone like me can get into regulation, but I still wouldn't be using this kind of multiple regulation. Mike has an answer I would want to do just old-fashioned cost-based yeah. regulation, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So why aren't you proposing cost-based so regulation so we're, for those markets? We're, we're proposing um, to uh, economists, 
friends. We're proposing something that's closer to a yardstick version of competition, maybe not exactly, where in situations like that, you would look at the 20th percentile in other markets and use that as a cap for what could be charged there. I think there's several other nuances we could talk about, about ways our proposal might be modified in order to um, deal with some of the lumpiness issues. Amitav was nice enough not to talk about some of the data noise issues that make this all so harder, so I probably shouldn't have but, raised but, it. But, what you but just that's said, how we, we do it. Michael might be some sort of a middle ground where you start with the yardstick competition model where you don't have this price dispersion, so in rural markets, where there's just one sort of behemoth provider and everyone is beholden to that provider. Now we want to think about regulating prices at that provider. All the worries about attaching that provider's prices to Medicare come in, and you could do things like, we're going to rate regulate you at 20%, because they're the, the, the argument that I'm making around, gee, it's quality and people want to pay for the extra quality is less likely to be true. Th that's true, except I think the problem becomes some of those places have a uh, smaller volume. There's economy of scale and production. You have to worry about that. It's not that I think we fundamentally would disagree. I think the bigger problem is because of a number of things related to search. And again, if you look at the work that Zach Cooper and I and some others have done, shows how bad the actual shopping process is. Um, you will find markets that look structurally competitive from a FTC kind of way in terms of our measures of competition that have some really extreme outliers in terms of where the prices are. And so the core question I think for people listening to ask themselves is, do you think that those extremes, those high multiples of any of even prices in the market reflect market power from those uh, providers or reflect a legitimate interest from employers or their workers to get amenities or a whole bunch of other things at those places. And if we were to address those high prices, as happens in things like reference pricing, would we see a commensurate reduction in quality? I think all the evidence suggests if you can target people to allow them to choose even high income people in the, in the reference pricing case, you will see them move to other places and you will not see the quality will drop, at least not in a strongly measurable so, way. So that's, those are really good. Let me, let me get to a couple of the audience questions. Um, somebody wrote in, how, if at all, would the problem you're trying to address and your proposal be different under a Medicare for all type system? <laughs> Very. <laughs> I'll, 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 be, I'll be brief. Um, me Medicare for all, right, would, uh, would imply that anyone would have uh, their providers paid at publicly administered rates, okay, which is not using the market to, to determine those rates. It is the case that a share of individuals are in Medicare Advantage plans where there is private negotiation of rates. Uh, and those rates tend to be pretty similar to what the publicly administered rates are. So we would be shifting uh, away from relying on markets to relying on, on what the government says should be the price for things. But, but our proposal is loosely what's in your local market times five. A Medicare proposal for, say, outpatient facility stuff is more like uh, uh, Medicare rates or, or the market rate times 0.8 or something like that. The 20th percentile. The 20th percentile. Is, so it's much, the prices will be much, much lower, much less room for any of the things that Amitabh is talking about. Let's bring this down to consumers. So how would your proposal affect them? I mean, are folks going to, I mean, if people are having a C-section in San Francisco, are they going to see their costs go down under your proposal? How, how would this translate into what consumers pay? Um, a couple of things, Julie. So the out-of-pocket spend for consumers uh, in the last four years has increased almost 15%. Uh, now, part of that is due to the rise in deductibles. A lot of this is going to be at the high end um, for hospitals, certainly, where we're not going to see a change. But certainly for some services, especially really, you know, uh, uh, at certain uh, um, uh, professional charges that are exceedingly high, patients. Uh, have low, have high deductibles or have co-insurance, they're going to see a benefit and they ought to see their premiums, uh, or I should say premium growth come down because realistically an actual, actual decline, this, this, that's hard to do it, and I expect that there would be a transition period uh, for this proposal. There's about a 10, a 8 to 10 percent savings off the top. I think the bigger effect for consumers is when there's less financial pressure on the premium, there's less pressure for employers to raise those deductibles and do a whole bunch of other things that they're otherwise doing. But in your, in your response, Limor, the, the assumption is, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but the assumption seems to be that because we reduced healthcare spending, consumers were better off. And 
I guess the ongoing... No, I think consumers pay less out of pocket. They pay less out of pocket, and that's desirable. And what I'm saying is what we're giving up is quality, including non-clinical quality, which is valuable to patients. When has it been established, I'm asking you, that a cut in the highest prices leads to diminished quality? On the contrary, the highest prices increasing is not associated with any quality improvements. I grant you that there's a cross-sectional relationship. Yeah. I just wouldn't want to rely on that nearly as much on the data that we have but about we have price the growth. Transactions the of millions of patients, yes. high-income patients, choosing these facilities. Right? They choose to go to these facilities. Employers choose to allow their employees to go to these facilities. I read a lot into that. I think people are willing. To, to give up income. You said it's so out of I, pocket. So I feel, I mean, I feel that in a way, we, we start our proposal with a statement of a problem. We think this is a problem. You don't. Yeah, I think it's much less of a problem. I think the only time it's a problem <laughs> is when people don't have choice and they're forced to go to the high-priced facility. What if I... That's what I think of as a problem. So I'm in a health plan pooled with lots of people who yeah. want those choices. Yeah. I have high premiums. And all of my enrollees, so many of my colleagues are going to these high high sites of yep. cost of, of care sites, uh, and I have high premiums. I can't do anything right. about so it. Right, so we should create a plan for that person to go to other facilities, not whack the choice. It's sort of like saying, you know, because some people choose to, to drive, you know, I'm going to have no Uber Black because you're all fine with Uber X. Why don't we just have Uber X? for people who want Uber X. And the people who want to pay extra prices and take Uber Black, they can take Uber Black. If the market and I think, was nearly as... Go I, ahead, Julia. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, you know what? This has been a great and robust discussion. And I think the points you just made, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there because we are going to be moving on to um, our next panel and our next um, presentation. But this has been really great. We've talk, covered a lot of things. I think your paper and, and others, uh, folks can read them online. And um, we're going to turn next to a research presentation by David Cutler. So we're going to do that. But so I want to thank the audience for participating and for sending in questions and continue to encourage you to do so as the afternoon moves on. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.
project for inviting me both to present here, but more importantly to um, uh, write this paper that we're releasing. Um, let me give you a bit about what is involved, what the paper says and, and why I did it. Um, as we were hearing both in the introduction to the overall webcast and in the previous panel, the urgent need to reduce spending on medical care is uh, something that, that, that's, th that, that keeps building. And one of the things about the, many of the solutions is that they address the price of health care. But in addition to that, you need to address the underlying cost structure of health care. So you have to be able to say both, I want to reduce what consumers pay, but then also because what consumers pay goes down, filters down to the providers, what it is the providers have to spend to run the business, to run healthcare. And so reducing that is actually the subject of this paper. And in particular, the biggest difference between the US and other countries in the cost of providing medical services is actually the administrative cost of healthcare. So all the billing and insurance and claims and all of that is part of the administrative structure that adds into the spending quite a lot. So what, what I focus on in this paper is how we can go about reducing the administrative costs of healthcare in the US. So let me just start off with some of the basic facts about administrative costs. Uh, the administrative costs, the estimates of the administrative costs of healthcare vary a lot depending both on what one counts as administration and on what, um, uh, what, sh what, what, what denominator one's looking at, total costs in the denominator. The estimate here is about 20% of US healthcare, although that's obviously somewhat un uh, uncertain. There are different types of, ad of administrative costs, and I want to focus on a couple of different dimensions of them. First, there is some administrative costs in private payers. That's the one that people think of in a lot. Those are things like billing and marketing and claims authorization um, and managing uh, payments and so on. But actually, there's a larger amount of money in um, uh, provider offices, hospitals, physicians and clinics and other providers who have to address the issues associated with um, uh, healthcare administration. Both of them are important, but a, a fair number of the issues here are going to focus on those that are in the provider uh, costs and not just in the, uh, in the insurance end. There are different types of administrative expenses. There's the most common, uh, the biggest group is what are called billing and insurance related expenses. Those are things like filing claims, managing the claims process, submitting bills back and forth, going through the prior authorization, so on. And then there are non-BIR, uh, non non-billing and insurance related expenses, general business expenses, HR and overhead and legal and all sorts of things like that. Um, I, I, I'm not going to make too big a uh, distinction because I think some things will cut across both. But, what, but, but there is a, a key distinction uh, that I do want to make, um, which is between what I'd call between expenses, that is administrative costs that are only going to be reduced when we get both sides of the transaction, both sides of the market to change. And then what I call within expenses, which are entirely internal operations. So an example of the between expense would be claims management. That is, a, a provider has to file multiple different forms with each different insurer. The form may be the same, but what goes in the form is different, and thus the, there's the people who have to be particularly attuned to what goes into the form for one payer versus what goes into the form for another payer. That's one type of between expense where if one standardized those, one wouldn't have to deal with that. There are also things about prior authorization where, again, it's the, it's the fact that it's the insurer, the payer dealing with the provider that's the source of the cost. And, and, and so that's probably about $150 billion or so of spending on those between expenses. I've, I've given the three biggest ones here, claims management, the claims processing cycle, prior authorization, and quality measurement and reporting. That's the keeping track of all the, the various quality information and reporting it and so on. Underlying all of those is data interoperability. That is, we spend a lot of money doing things manually because we don't have the data where we need it to do it, uh, it, it, to, to do it electronically, to do it uh, uh, interoperably. So I'm going to discuss those four. I'm going to leave aside these issues of sort of within expenses, which is, is the C-suite, is the legal, legal team, and so on, far too big. My sense is that um, proposals that successfully address the between expenses will also address the within expenses, but I actually haven't even estimated any savings from that. So I'm going to tell you about savings that could be on the order of 50, 60 billion dollars a year from administrative cost savings, a lot of money, but and I'm going to leave out all of the, uh, uh, all of the, the within specific uh, types of expenses. Uh, so where are we in healthcare? Let me just start with where the landscape is. 
we have pushed to have many things electronic, and public policy has, to its credit, done a good job pushing this, going all the way back to the HIPAA uh, legislation in the 1990s, up through the Affordable Care Act, and in the 21st Century Cures, and so on, and recent legislation. So we've pushed a number of things. So many things are now fully electronic. That is, claim submission is electronic, for example, and coordination of benefits is electronic. Some things are partially electronic, and, and other things are not particularly electronic at all. The most important of those are things down at the bottom of the chart, prior authorization, which is uh, still largely handled by phone and by fax, uh, and claims attachments as something that has to be attached to the claim so that the, the, the payer will, will pay it. Um, so obviously those things at the bottom are big concerns because we're using people where other industries use computers, and computers for these routine transactions are much uh, cheaper than our people. In fact, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, more secure and higher quality as well. Even the top parts, though, are actually more expensive than they need to be. And the reason is that while the form goes from the payer to from the provider to the payer uh, electronically and then another form gets sent back electronically, the preparation of that involves an enormous amount of manual work. And so it, in, if you compare, for example, healthcare to banking, um, which is one of the examples that I talk about in the paper, in the banking system, the um, uh, uh, there's very little individual personal involvement, involvement of people in the transmission of money between one bank and another, where there's still an enormous amount of people involved there. So, so we're starting from an okay base, as we've had some success in the past, but nowhere near as much success as we would like. Um, so what is the government doing here? There are really three rationales which lead to the types of changes that are going to be needed. One is there's a sort of public good, which is that no organization will invest in coordination on its own. In fact, it's actually even worse than that, which is that organizations have incentives to not coordinate with each other because then the data can't be shifted from one provider to another, one electronic medical record to another, and therefore you have a situation where um, payers will, uh, and uh, EMR vendors and, and providers and health systems will actually pay money to make their data not be available. That's really uh, terrible. That's happened in a number of other industries, and, and every time the government has to come in and say, no, you can't do that. Um, and so we're going to need the same thing here in administrative costs. The government's going to have to be involved for other reasons as well. It is also a big payer. Obviously, the federal government is a huge payer for medical care, and so nothing can happen without the federal government being involved. But there's also a point down there, which is that the price ain't right. And one of the things about administrative costs is that, in general, they're not paid for on a piece rate basis. That is, an, a payer that thinks about, for example, should I eliminate prior authorization requirements for a particular medication or for a particular procedure, that um, uh, provider will... Um, realize savings from its own internal operations, but it doesn't pay less because it's imposed less of a burden on the provider. So it doesn't achieve, it doesn't realize any of the savings from lower spending elsewhere in the system. That's really a problem here because that then suggests that they don't have sufficient incentives to get rid of things, or conversely, they're not seeing the full cost of adding additional complexity to the system. So one of the key proposals that I make here, in addition to standardization, I'll tell you how the proposals play out in just uh, one slide, but one of the key issues here, in addition to standardization, is going to be to try and implement a set of prices where it's clear to payers and providers how much administrative uh, transactions, how much administrative costs uh, account for for each claim, and then say this is something that has to be paid for creating it. And thus that's going to give an incentive to say I don't need to create that uh, if I don't, uh, if it's not worth doing so. So the, broadly speaking, what the proposals involve is standardization, that is using um, uh, 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 electronic tools to substitute for individuals and thus st by standardizing. And second is making complexity be priced, and so those prices can then signal when we have too much of it. So let me talk about some of the specifics, and I, I want to do it in terms of the four areas that I highlighted earlier. And the first is claims processing. The most obvious analog to claims processing in healthcare is the flow of money in banking. In banking, there are actually two parts to the flow of money. First, there's setting standards. That is, the, there's an organization which sets standards for what must be in submissions that banks uh, send in. And second, there's actual transfers that go between banks. So if you tell your bank to pay money to, to a company, your bank says, okay, I want to take money from this account and I want to send it over to this bank and this account for, for who's to receive the money. And so in the middle is the organization that does those transfers. It is actually a very cheap system. It costs probably about $300 million a year to transfer about $53 trillion a year. So it's extremely cheap. All banks have to do this because the Federal Reserve says if you want to transfer money, you have to follow these rules. Um, the idea in healthcare is to basically try and recreate this because currently each 
receiving institution requires different things in different ways. Again, even the form is the same, but, the, but what goes into it is very different. So the question is how to set up something like that in healthcare, and that's really what's proposed here which is to say that there would be a clearinghouse, there would be two organizations. First, there's the clearinghouse, which will transfer things back and forth, and second is a standard setting organization. We actually already have a standard setting organization, healthcare, that's how those transactions have become standardized so far, so that already exists. What would be needed would be the, would be the organization that then says, this is how we're going to transfer it. In the case of banking, that's sort of required, you could either do the required version in healthcare, that is, you could say, this is the only way you can transmit information, or what I have here is you say, well, no, you can do it outside of that. As a payer, you can request or require something outside of that, but you have to pay for it in the way we were talking about. If you create additional administrative complexity, you have to pay for it. The cost of running this system, if it's like banking, would be roughly $300 million or so. There would also be one-time costs of a bigger amount for computer updates in both private insurers and in public uh, uh, insurance plans, particularly Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I don't have an estimate of that, but the potential savings would be enormous uh, on the order of maybe $20 billion or so a year. And remember, those are largely one-time costs. So it's not an issue of, of would it be worth doing. It's really an issue of coming up with the money in the short term because we know that the savings are happening in the long term. And we do have examples of that, as I was talking about in other industries. So that's the first big thing is the, cl the, the clearinghouse for transactions to enforce standardization. The second thing I want to talk about is prior authorization reform, and this is uh, fewer dollars, but it's enormously frustrating. All providers say that this is the thing that bothers them the most about, uh, about healthcare administration. It's leading to burnout, it's leading providers to leave practice, and, uh, and uh, a number of other things, patient frustration as well as patients have to deal with it. There's been a, a group of organizations that have come together and say we want to do uh, 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 some prior authorization reforms. So far that hasn't happened uh, to a great extent. Um, uh, although uh, there's potential for more good things to be done. There, what I point out in the paper is that first there are several existing uh, rules that we know about that, that, that we can put in place, encourage more use of, and by encourage more use of what I really mean is the government should help to spur the adoption of things like that. So the, the most common thing that one hears about that one wonders about are things like gold cards where providers who have done a good job in the past or who have installed uh, uh, computer systems on top of their EMR system to say, yes, this is approved by certain guidelines, then don't need to get additional approval from the insurer because the insurer can use the attestation of the guidelines that it's appropriate. Things like that are really quite available and they could be done right away. It's just they, they, there hasn't been pushing for them. In part, there hasn't been pushing for them because no one actually has to pay the cost to the provider for each prior authorization claim. So I'm going to come back to that part again. The cost is estimated to be about $12 per claim, and the payer doesn't have to pay money when they impose that $12 cost. And so a big part of this is making that cost be there, in which case both the payer and the provider will then say, yes, if we can develop other alternatives like not questioning every case and using gold card procedures and so on, then that's going to be financially worthwhile to us. So it's setting in place both what, what is the best practice now and also building in an economic justification for the best practice uh, to be the chosen one. That will be enormously important because the typical physician who does any prior authorization, obviously things like pathologists tend not to, uh, handles quite a large number, about 30 per week. Similarly, in the case of quality metrics, we have, uh, again, a situation where there's a cacophony rather than a symphony, so we have many different uh, parts of the orchestra and they're all playing different things. Um, a decade ago, it was pointed out that Medicare had about 1,200 quality metrics and it was hoped that it would be reduced. Uh, alas, in the last decade, it's roughly doubled, so Medicare now has over 2,000 different quality metrics for its various programs. State and regional organizations have another 1,000 plus. If you look just among a subset of insurers, you get hundreds more quality metrics. Um, everything we know about quality metrics is that in order for them to be successful, they need to be meaningful. That is, they, they pick up true dimensions of quality. They need to be harmonized, and they need to be based on electronic medical records not, and patient reports, not just on, uh, 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 on claims information. We have examples of where this can be done. Uh, for example, Minnesota is requiring insurers to submit uh, 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 to utilize uh, the common information that comes in, um, it seems to be doing well. The administrative costs in Minnesota, I don't know if it's because of this or for other reasons, no one has done a study exactly on that, um, are uh, low and actually falling as a share of, of uh, total insurer spending. So, so th this sort of harmonization is sort of along the lines of what we're talking about. And again, one can think about the cost part of this, which is making there be a payment associated with, um, uh, with, with, with making things more complex than they ought to be.
The final issue is, uh, of the substantive issues is, is, is that healthcare lags in the electronic data interchange. So on the left is sort of what typically happens in businesses where you can now access things electronically. Um, I found the equivalent of the electronic access in healthcare, there it is on the right, which is the individual in the fax machine. It seems, I think the only place in the world where fax machines are still common is healthcare. It must be keeping the fax industry uh, alive by itself. Or someone yeah, said, if know, we want to kill the fax machine, we need to schedule a funeral. Um, and that's what we should do, which is to take advantage of what's happening on the left, which is in the typical industries, and transport it to what's happening on the right. Uh, in this case, there are lots of use cases for it. There's both the provider to provider data sharing. Gosh, wouldn't it be nice to know in things like uh, outbreaks of disease where, where uh, which patients have uh, been tested positive or negative. But also for patients who want to consolidate their records and insurers who may be required to keep longitudinal uh, records, um, all of those cases create an opportunity to do this. We actually have the tools because they show up in other industries. It's really now a question of applying them in exactly the same uh, ways we were talking about. I try in the paper to estimate the total amount of savings that would uh, come from this. Um, my guess is that conservatively savings could be on the order of 50 to 75 billion dollars a year. Um, I say that conservatively because, again, I've dealt only with these sort of between areas, that is where it requires coordination amongst multiple parties to do. I haven't at all touched the sort of within uh, parts, which I think are addressable and, and would be affected as well. But again, I just wanted to be very conservative here. That by itself would not bring us to the Canadian level of administrative costs. I don't think anything other than putting in a, an exact style of a Canadian system would do so. But but it would get us a reasonable part of the way there, and that's that's a fair amount of money that could then be passed on uh, to consumers, it's several thousand dollars per, per uh, 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 close to a thousand dollars per consumer per year uh, in uh, in savings. That's that's absolutely something we ought to think about. Um, as with anything, there are questions, uh, and so I'll just give you a couple of them here. Um, is single payer the answer? Well, it might be, and I say might because it really depends enormously on how you do this single payer system. It's not just a, a, an on off. There are actually choices, and that influences it. But as the saying, as as I was saying here, it's not the only answer. Um, and even in a single payer, you'd have to address a lot of these things because uh, because companies now do have different EMR systems and there are different payment rules and all sorts of things like that that would have to be addressed. Uh, will jobs be lost? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, that's part of healthcare reform. That is, healthcare should not be a jobs program. It should be something to deliver people medical care. And if we don't need administrative folks, then we shouldn't be hiring them in healthcare. There are many other things that people can do. It will require upfront costs. I don't think they're big uh, amounts of money. We, we have thankfully spent the biggest amount of money on the electronic medical records. Now what we need to do is say, okay, now that we've invested in those, how do we take advantage of them, not just for storing information, not just for some communication across the, uh, across the system, but to use them to drive down administrative costs as well as to improve the aspects of, of patient care. So that's really where we are. I think we've done a lot of the heavy lifting. What we need to do now is to take advantage of that and drive towards getting these savings, I am optimistic that they can be done, and I hope that uh, that this that this paper provides a foundation uh, for doing so. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for staying with us for this final panel, which is how can increased competition reduce healthcare costs? I'm Jay Shamba, director of the Hamilton Project, and welcome to the stage here at Brookings. Um, we heard on an earlier panel a uh, concern that competition can't do enough or do everything, uh, but it still has a big role, and that's what we'd like to talk about today. The fact that hospitals, specialists, uh, specialist physicians, insurers all have market concentration above a level that is typically marked as high concentration, and primary care physicians are, are in some sense rising and moving close to that level as well. Um, there have been many mergers in the healthcare industry, many ways in which competition seems unable to act to work on price and quality. And so what we'd like to do now is talk about what we can do. Um, and to do so, we have a terrific panel to talk about that. Um, I'll just introduce people quickly and then we'll dive in. So Martin Gaynor is the E.J. Barone University Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon and a former director of the Bureau of Economics at the FTC, and uh, Marty authored a proposal for us at the Hamilton Project, um, and that's part of what we'll be talking about today. Elizabeth Fowler, to his left, is the Executive Vice President at the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, she has a long history in health policy, including uh, global health policy at Johnson & Johnson, a special assistant to the President for Health Policy and Economic Policy at the NEC. 
uh, the chief health counsel at Senate Finance as the Affordable Care Act was being written, uh, and so a lot of different perspectives to share on, on health policy and competition in policy. Uh, to her left, Noah Phillips is a commissioner at the FTC. Uh, Prior to that was a lawyer and a counsel to Senator Cornyn, um, but so in a position at the FTC, can hopefully share a lot about what we could be doing. And finally, uh, to my immediate left is Paul Ginsburg. He's a colleague of mine here at Brookings. He is the director of the USC Schaefer Institute for Health Policy and a senior fellow in economic studies and professor of health policy at USC. And he was the founder and longtime president of the Center, center for Studying Health System Change. Um, so. I'd like to start with you, Marty, and start just asking you to tell us a little bit about your concerns with competition in the healthcare sector and kind of the policies you would like to see to address that. Right, thanks, Jay, and, and thanks to uh, the Hamilton Project and Brookings Institution for convening this panel and supporting these efforts. So as, as people may know, we have a market-based healthcare system. And what that means is that uh, the U.S. healthcare system is only going to work as well as the markets that underpin it. Unfortunately, these markets just don't work as well as they could or as they should, and we can see that every time that we engage with the healthcare system or just look at some simple facts. We have high and rising costs, very high prices, egregious business practices, surprise bills, supposedly not-for-profit community hospitals. Uh, using debt collection to go after people, garnishing their wages, poor quality of care, and a sluggish and unresponsive healthcare system. Outside of that, we're doing great. Uh, one of the reasons for these problems is that there's not enough competition in healthcare markets. We've seen over the past 20 to 30 years just huge amounts of consolidation in the healthcare system, although I want to be clear, that's not the only thing to look at when figuring out how competitive markets are. But nonetheless, just like over about 1,600 hospital mergers in the past 20 some odd years, many, many markets in the United States are dominated by one huge healthcare system, like my own hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, for example. And that has a lot to do. With, uh, with this per performance. What do we get from all this, these decades of consolidation? We haven't gotten better quality. We haven't gotten more coordinated care. We haven't gotten a more innovative, responsive healthcare system. What we've gotten are higher healthcare prices, and we have little else to show for it. So I have uh, a set of policies, uh, I'll call them a, an umbrella set of policies, to help enhance to enable and promote competition where it's possible and to flexibly intervene where it's not. So there are roughly three components to these policies. One, reduce or eliminate policies, some of these federal, some of these state, that artificially encourage consolidation or impede entry or competition. Two, Strengthen antitrust enforcement so that federal and state agencies can act effectively to prevent and remove harms to competition. Just one piece of information, from 2010 to 2018, the number of merger filings with the DOJ and FTC went up by 57%. Over that same nine-year period, their budget adjusted for inflation fell by 12%. Enforcement actions have stayed completely flat over this time period where we've had this huge merger wave. And mergers are only one piece of this, uh, this puzzle. And last, the la third piece of these policies, create a, a new agency at the federal level or agencies at the state level responsible for monitoring and oversight of all healthcare markets. And that has to be backed up or supported by a national healthcare data warehouse to provide the information this is the information age, after all, and information's part of our infrastructure, just like bridges and railroads and airports. Uh, that has to back that up and support it, just for monitoring and oversight, but also intervention, flexibly, where necessary, where there's little potential for competition, markets that are dominated by a large entity, that, that little little possibility of competition getting in or being enabled. 
then this agency would have the authority to intervene when and where necessary. So those are the three components to try and make healthcare markets work better so that all Americans benefit, as opposed to now, in which uh, there are just a small set of, of entities that are benefiting and most individuals are being harmed. Great, thanks, that's really helpful. Um, Liz, I'd like to turn to you and just ask from your perspective what you think competition and competition policy could maybe accomplish in this space. What could we do to, to make the healthcare sector work better? Sure, and thanks a lot for the invitation to be here today. Uh, it's a, a little odd to be in an empty yeah. room um, in, front of, um, in front of all you, but i um, really glad to be here and, and appreciate the opportunity. I really appreciate also the excellent paper that Marty wrote um, and a lot of the ideas that that, um, that he explored in the paper. And a lot of that work is consistent with some of the work that the Commonwealth uh, Fund is examining. Um, we're looking at competition in healthcare prices, particularly for hospital services. Uh, we are looking at the role of pricing transparency and the potential for um, states to become um, stronger actors in this space. So I think it's all very consistent. Um, you know, this panel is talking about competition. The previous panel talked about regulation. Um, you know, we debate whether um, we should have a free market versus a government-run healthcare system. And the fact of the matter is we have the worst of both worlds. We don't really have competition, as Marty points out, but we don't really have regulation either. We sort of end up with the most expensive system out of um, all possible combinations. And um, some of the work at the Commonwealth Fund is also looking at uh, the results of that expense um, in terms of growing underinsured and um, the rising deductibles and unaffordable cost sharing. Um, in terms of the recommendations from the paper, um, if states and the federal government adopted um, and implemented these recommendations, I think we'd be well on our way to restoring competition in healthcare markets. Um, I was particularly pleased to see the recommendation on 340B. We talk a lot about 340B, and I think, but not in the context of competition and the role that it's played in a lot of the consolidation um, and um, in the hospital markets. It's a market distortion. It, um, the benefit is split very unevenly across hospitals, and um, it generates a substantial stream of revenue for hospital systems that qualify. Um, and I don't think that's what Congress intended. That wasn't the purpose of the program, so I was really pleased to see that. Um, on the issue of network adequacy requirements, I agree this is something to take a look at, but I think um, another point to think about is that as we're increasingly focused on social determinants of health and the role that um, transportation plays and, and how it's often a barrier to seeking care and, and receiving care, I wonder whether it's possible to think about loosening, um, as we are thinking about loosening any restrictions on network adequacy requirements, that we also think about subsidies to provide transportation to people who need it. Um, the additional funding for regulatory agencies makes sense. I'm sure NOAA appreciates that recommendation. Um, these agencies have clearly been under-resourced for way too long. And, um, and I'm also interested in thinking more about the potential new agency that Marty had recommended. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund just put out a um, case study on the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission, and um, maybe we should also take a closer look at the Dutch Healthcare Authority. Um, I didn't see a lot about pr um, price transparency, and I know this issue came up in the previous um, panel and the role that price transparency could play in increased competition. I feel um, that we are putting the burden, though, on consumers, and when we talk about price transparency, we're thinking that consumers and patients are gonna make more choices or better choices if they had this information. And I, I, I guess I personally think that um, we should think about um, pricing transparency as a tool for employers and payers in the system and as a way for them to understand the, the, what they're paying versus um, what the public programs are paying. Um, and we're looking at price transparency. We have a study underway that compares commercial rates to Medicare, for example. We're looking at the role of all payers claims databases. We support um, a federal approach, and I think you, you did bring up that point as well, um, to gener generate information that can inform uh, the public and, and also payers. Um, so those were my sort of initial responses, um, but really um, pleased to be here. Thanks again. Uh, great, thanks. No, I'd like to turn to you. So we've heard some things about what we could be doing on um, competition in the healthcare space. I wonder if you could share a little bit about what we are doing already in some sense and what the FTC is doing in this area. Absolutely, and Jay, thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here um, with, with the great folks on this panel. I, I always have to begin these things um, by, with the caveat that what I'm gonna say is just my own opinion and not necessarily the views of other commissioners or the commission as an institution. But it is wonderful to be here with you and 
with the Brookings Institution and the Hamilton Project. So I don't think there's any issue uh, that so affects American consumers in terms of their worrying about costs as healthcare. Um, everyone seems to recognize this, and I think it's a priority for all of us at the agency. Um, and I want to highlight today three things we're doing on the competition side of the house that I think um, have made an impact and can continue to make an impact. And I want to break them down into three buckets. Um, so the first bucket is enforcement, enforcing the antitrust laws. The second bucket is advocacy, uh, working to help other entities um, change the way their systems work. Uh, to some extent, this maps onto some of the issues raised in Marty's paper um, with respect to some of the impediments uh, that state laws can impose. Um, and then th the third is study, continuing to add to the project in which we're all engaged, trying to understand better how, to the extent we have markets or to the extent we have regulation, how they're functioning. Um, so with respect to enforcement, um, it's been a really exciting past, uh, let's say, two years. Uh, we're building on important work that's been done before. Uh, with respect to mergers and conduct, both the FTC is very active. So on the merger side, um, a couple of issues that I'll note. Uh, with respect to the provision of healthcare services, uh, we just went to court uh, in the last two weeks um, to stop a merger in Philadelphia of two big hospital chains. Um, we are very actively following hospital mergers. As Marty notes, some of those don't get triggered by Hart Scott Redino, um, but that doesn't mean we can't challenge uh, transactions. Uh, and we're very active in that space, and I think you can continue to see us be active. That activity and the success we've had builds on a lot of work learning, understanding the economic dynamics of the markets, um, and learning how to convince judges to go along with our theories uh, of anti-competitive harm. Um, the united DeVita merger, which was both a horizontal and a vertical merger of an insurer uh, and healthcare providers in certain geographic markets, um, another example of enforcement uh, on that side. Uh, of course, we look at pharmaceutical mergers. Uh, that's something we've always done. It's something we continue to do. Um, but I'll also note some uh, merger enforcement that is sort of healthcare adjacent. So we used a Section 2 theory not long ago uh, to sue to block the merger of Illumina and PacBio. That's in gene sequencing. And that's a technology in a market that is going to be increasingly relevant to how healthcare is provided in the United States. We were concerned about a monopolist buying a nascent competitor um, and intervened uh, to stop that. The other set of cases that I'd note on the enforcement side are conduct cases. Um, so these are not in the merger conducts, but they're conduct in which companies are engaging that we feel uh, distorts or perverts competition. Um, and I'll pick out, uh, there are a number of instances I could use. Uh, I'll pick out the Daraprim case involving Viera. Um, so this is a sort of now notorious company uh, involving Martin Shkreli, uh, where they, uh, with a patent, uh, a drug that was off patent, uh, undertook a variety of strategies to prevent generics from coming to market. Uh, and we, again, using a monopolization, a Section 2 theory, um, we're in court on that right now. Uh, there are pay-for-delay cases. Um, there's a bunch of different, the SureScripts case, which involves um, health records. Um, uh, again, using a Section 2 theory, we were concerned that SureScripts, the defendant, uh, is engaged in a variety of kinds of conduct to prevent others from entering into the markets um, where it is a monopolist, um, uh, eligibility and routing. Um, so there's a lot of really active work um, on the antitrust enforcement side. That's sort of bucket one. Uh, bucket number two, as I mentioned, is advocacy. Uh, we do a lot of work with state governments in particular, uh, helping to bring down barriers um, to people who want to practice in the provision of health care. Um, and to people who want to build new hospitals and add beds, which can be really important, right? Entry is a really important way that the market deals uh, with what can be the negative effects of consolidation. Uh, and so I'll, I'll take as an example, uh, we're very active in advocating two states on scope of work provisions. Uh, for instance, allowing nurses, um, let's say, to do the maximum work for which they are trained and not necessarily under the constant supervision of doctors. In rural areas and other areas where you have a supply problem, um, expanding the availability um, of healthcare workers and what they can do can be really meaningful. 
Um, another uh, area that I'll identify is certificates of need, right? So these are um, state provisions that prevent the building of hospitals. Um, and that's something that we're really concerned about and we like to advocate um, to eliminate those barriers to entry as we have done in the past year. Um, and then the last thing that I mentioned was study. Uh, so the FTC is a great agency for a variety of reasons, but one of those reasons is we have special study powers, our 6B authority, and we're constantly evaluating how we do things on the consumer protection, but importantly for purposes here on the competition side. Uh, so we're doing a study right now on uh, COPA laws, right, uh, which can operate to shield from antitrust scrutiny transactions that can have an anti-competitive effect. Um, there are a variety of reasons that these things exist and why they're triggered, um, but we're interested in learning about the effects that they have, um, and we've done a workshop on them, and we've seen some really negative effects. Uh, so that's an example of something that we're studying, and I think enforcement, advocacy in particular to states, and continuing the ongoing study are some things that are being done today to help advance the cause of competition in healthcare markets. Thanks, that, that's a terrific kind of tour of, of what's, what's going on now. Um, Paul, I want to kind of finish this first round with you and think about how much you think competition and antitrust policies really can do in the healthcare market, and in some sense, why haven't we seen more of it already o over time? Sure. sure, Jay. It's really a pleasure to be on your panel. And for many, many years, I've been working on this issue of what can public policy do to foster more competition in healthcare. And a very enjoyable fact aspect of doing this is that there's a lot of at least rhetorical support from both sides of the aisle for this direction. So it's been comfortable. And but now Marty's done a really good job of outlining the extensive range in policies uh, that could be pursued to make the healthcare system more competitive. And two conclusions of his really stood out to me. One was that many policies will be needed to be pursued to accomplish this. There isn't a single policy that will make healthcare more competitive. And the second one is that even if all the policies are pursued, there will still be markets already so consolidated that significant competition won't be possible. But looking back over time, I'm becoming increasingly concerned that while we have a pretty good idea of what the policy agenda to foster competition should be, very little of it has been pursued. I was excited 10 years ago when Massachusetts passed legislation banning anti-tiering clauses in contracts between providers and insurers. But as far as I know, no other state legislatures have followed this, although there have been a few recent agreements between state attorneys general and providers that they had challenged. A recent update of an earlier analysis of state laws to foster competition by Catalyst for Payment Reform found very limited progress. A key component of the competitive strategy is more vigorous antitrust enforcement, especially going beyond horizontal mergers to challenge more recent developments such as vertical mergers. Uh, but Marty has documented the sharp decline in federal resources adjusted for inflation. For antitrust enforcement, it was really shocking to me. And of course, the healthcare system continues to race ahead in becoming more consolidated and less competitive. Now, realistically, healthcare stakeholders do not want a more competitive healthcare system, and they will forcefully resist many of the policies that would foster more competition. So policymakers who have supported this approach and concept will have to take some tough votes to turn it into law. A key component of a strategy for a more competitive healthcare system is capping the tax subsidies to employer-sponsored health insurance. But Congress recently repealed the Cadillac tax version of this policy with large bipartisan majorities, despite its enormous impact on the federal deficit. We know that competitive tools such as narrow or tiered networks rarely appear in employer-sponsored insurance, where lavish health benefits are still seen as a key tool for recruitment and retention. A key test of how con serious Congress is about fostering competition will come over the next two to three months. Important provisions that would foster competition are included in versions of the legislation to address surprise medical building, billing 
that have been reported by the Senate Help Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Whether those provisions are included in the final legislation, if there is final legislation, will tell us a lot about how committed policymakers are to this approach. So I'm concerned about the prospect of many more years of talking about fostering competition without getting much done. To me, it's time to be thinking about more about regulatory approaches. I believe it's possible to design regulatory approaches that are compatible with competition, such as focusing rate constraints on the outlier providers and keeping regulatory approaches simple. The Daphne and Chernu paper really are an example of that type of thinking. So pursuing regulation does not mean abandoning the strategy of fostering competition, but I'm less willing than before to bet all of our resources on a competitive approach. Thanks. That's a, a kind of a great segue. We've heard, you know, what we can do, what we are doing, and in some sense, what we're what we're not doing enough on. And I want to pick up on this last point you made and kind of pitch this to everyone, which is, as we're thinking about all the things we could do with competition policy, are there also spots where we just say, and we're going to need a regulatory approach as well? And so, Marty, in some sense, you nod that way in the proposal itself by having this kind of new agency that's in charge. And so I just want to hear a little bit from people on how much they think the competition policy goals could accomplish and how much you really do feel the need to bring in a regulatory aspect. Yeah, I, I think, uh, thanks, Paul, for bringing, the, bringing this up. You know, there are lots of different facets to this. But, but one thing, I, I think it's not regulation or competition. It's regulation and competition. Markets need a certain amount of government oversight in order to work, even if it's pretty minimal, mm -hmm. just setting the rules of the road. And that's regulation. Sometimes they need more active intervention. So what... What I propose is, again, enable and promote competition where it can happen, but there are some places where it's just not going to happen, at least not, not in any uh, reasonable amount of time, and there, let's have a flexible approach to, uh, to regulatory oversight, uh, not simply price cap regulation, which can be fine in, in some circumstances, but I think something that provides a lot more flexibility and also is not necessarily permanent. So if circumstances change, that competition is possible, then uh, we don't have uh, regulation uh, just embedded in place. That's one. As far as politics, and look, I'm no political analyst. I'm not a political scientist. Um, I'm not an advocate. and I. I'm just a simple person. I don't have a lobbying budget. But <laughs> it's not obvious. Paul's right. This is not the first time by any means that some or all of us have been on a stage talking about policies towards healthcare markets. We've been doing this for a long time, and we've seen uh, some progress, uh, but not nearly enough. I agree with Paul uh, on that. It's not obvious to me that moving towards a, a regulatory approach is any easier politically than is competition. It does have some appeal. If you just say, okay, here's one thing, price cap regulation, then at least superficially it looks like it's just one thing and it, it looks simpler. Where I agree, if, if you read my proposal, and I hope people will take a look, there's a lot of different right. moving parts. Yeah. Although I feel any one of those things would still, still help. But I don't know that, uh, that saying let's enact uh, price cap regulation is an, any easier, is an easier sell politically against powerful interests than is let's increase funding for the FTC or let's create a new agency to monitor and oversee healthcare markets. I'm just saying, I, I don't know, but it's not, it's not obvious to me. Liz, could I come to you on the same kind of question of how we think about competition versus regulation in this space? Well, um, it was an interesting point, and I think we also, um, when it comes to competition versus regulation, when it comes to drug pricing, I think there's an area where both sides of the aisle, to some extent, have sort of decided that pure competition is not going to bring down uh, drug prices, um, that you have a natural mon monopoly under a patent system. We've decided we like that because it, it is a way to get new drugs. There's some gaming of some of those, um, some of those um, rules, as, as we've pointed out. But, um, but both sides of the aisle now are looking at whether we need to step in and, 
and maybe look at um, capping some of the price increases and or even go straight to where the house has gone, which is negotiation. And I got, I got one, one idea on that that's very simple yeah. and would get us a long way there. Just allow Medicare to take, uh, take cost of a treatment into account when making coverage decisions. They're prohibited from doing that. If they could look at that with regard to drugs or anything else, then all of a sudden, even if you got a monopoly, you have a strong incentive to think about how much you're charging for that, that drug or that, or that treatment. But that's not what we're. Yeah, <laughs> but about but interesting, and we should explore that a little more. Sure. But but I but to back to the discussion, this is a point where we've decided that maybe pure competition isn't isn't going to work to lower drug prices. Um, to the point about how difficult this is to do politically, um, I think both both arguments. I mean, both sides of this coin are are difficult to get through. Um, Congress, if you think about it today, almost anything seems to be difficult to get through Congress. Although now, with now that we're faced with a potential pandemic, and you know, maybe there is, maybe this is an opportunity to think about this question and what else might be able to um, to get done in the, you know in this window. Um, but I will say, you know, the problem with something like um, surprise billing is is it's just losing. You're just you've just got a loser. Um, that it's easier to think about legislation when uh, you can create sort of a, maybe you win some, you lose some, but it's not just that you're losing. So maybe there's an opportunity to open the door a little bit and think about healthcare pricing and competition and regulation a little bit more broadly and, and a little bit more comprehensively. And, and I think either in the context of um, some sort of, you know, bill to address some of the problems in our system that are coming to bear um, under the coronavirus. Um, maybe there's an opportunity. Um, I think at some point Congress is going to have to look at Medicare solvency um, and that, that presents a potential vehicle and an opportunity to look at, at some of these issues. So, so I wouldn't give up on it um, entirely. No, you obviously have a competition <laughs> lens here. Um, but I'm curious how, sitting at the FTC, when you're, when you're struggling in some of these cases, trying to figure out how you can use competition policy, if there are spots where you're thinking, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to need some help from the other side. We're going to need some regulatory action because our actions just aren't going to be sufficient. So let me sort of offer some general framing and yeah. then get a little closer to, to the question. The general framing, right, is that, and I, I suspect everyone, I hope everyone would agree with this, is, you know, all things equal, you hope in a wonderful world, markets do a lot of work, right? right. And the competition that the market provides helps to achieve whatever quality benefits or lower prices that you would hope would exist. Antitrust serves a role to try to kind of, on a targeted level, correct some of the things that can happen, whether it be a merger or a series, a set of conduct that impedes the market from working. But the underlying premise to the thing is that absent the merger, the conduct, what have you, the market would work. Um, where you have market failure, right, that's where regulation, um, especially the less flexible kind about which Marty is worried, that's where it has a greater role. Healthcare markets, you've got a really weird amalgam, right? And we kind of have this world that we face. So I don't think we can approach it from the perspective of the kind of theoretical perfect, right? Um, as an antitrust enforcer, though, I, I think there are two things I want to add. The first is that um, whatever the situation, right, whatever the set of laws that we've adopted, wherever Congress has gone or hasn't gone, um, we're going to look for how people are manipulating that process. <coughs> we're going to look um, within the context of the law to root out problems. So I'll, I'll throw out one example. We've got this appeal right <coughs> now in the Fifth Circuit um, on a pay for delay case. Um, that's a context where you've got the patent right, you've got the monopoly right. I think everyone agrees it's really important to support competition, but that doesn't mean there aren't things people will do that distort the competitive process. Um, and that's always something for, uh, you know, at which we're going to look. Um, that we had a recent case, I, I didn't highlight it earlier, that dealt with product topping. So this is another conduct in which parties engage within the confines of the system that we have, uh, where we're worried about abuse, um, where we think antitrust law can make an important difference. But I do want to level that with a little bit of um, reality. And, and that is the following thing. Antitrust can't do everything. 
Um, and there are a lot of people right now, if you read the editorial pages <laughs> these days, who really feel like antitrust can solve everything, and that look at maybe broad wording, or just their view of what antitrust law is, a general law against corporate power or whatever, um, can and should do. So let's take price regulation. There are people trying to use antitrust to accomplish price regulation. That's a worthy debate. Um, but it's not a debate about antitrust law. It's a debate about regulation. And I want to leaven this conversation. Leaven may be the wrong word. <laughs> I want to add to this conversation. We have a month or so until. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> right, oh gosh, I need to clean my house. Um, with some reality of what the law is intended to do and can realistically accomplish. And I do think putting too many eggs in that basket is the wrong way to go. That's, that's really great, thanks. And Paul, I know you, I think, I had a sense you wanted to hop in when Marty was suggesting that, well, look, regula regulation would be really hard to do politically too, and so I just. Yeah, I think there are two ways to think of why regulation might be easier to do politically. One is a matter of you know, the stakeholders. What do they fear more, regulation or competition? They may fear competition more. That's what many economists would say. <laughs> The second thing is that if you go back 12 years, uh, there was a long period of time when federal policymakers cared about the deficits. And that often led to a series of omnibus uh, packages of legislation to reduce the deficits. Um, regulatory packages can save money, both on the spending side and on the revenue side. And they probably, you know, they're easier to score by the CBO than proposals to foster more competition. So I think uh, at some point, we're gonna have to be concerned about the deficit again. When we get there, uh, Liz mentioned the, uh, the Medicare trust funds running out of money. I think that's gonna be uh, gonna somewhat of a game changer in, uh, in the potential of uh, making regulation politically feasible. I wanna j just real quick to our audience, um, my team has passed forward some questions that have come from Twitter, so if you're still uh, tweeting while you watch, please send more questions at uh, using the hashtag healthcare costs or to at Hamilton Proj. Um, and Marty, you wanted to hop back in? Just, just real quick. First, I think Paul's point is a, is a really in, intriguing one, and it will be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, you know, if it can't go, go on forever, it won't, mm -hmm. although lack of attention to budgets and deficits seemingly has gone a long time. But uh, I think both to, to the points that were made earlier, even if we move to a price regulated system, that doesn't mean competition is no longer an issue. And I, I'm sure, I can't speak for Noah, uh, but I'm sure Noah would acknowledge this, that, uh, that the FTC and the DOJ are concerned not only with prices, but with quality, innovation, the whole realm of things that, that matter in markets. And we have a lot of evidence under-administered prices, both in the U.S. Medicare system and abroad from the English NHS, that, uh, that where there's a potential for competition, quality is higher under a regulated price system. And where there's less potential, quality is lower. And what we're talking about in the research studies, measures of quality, is mortality. So actually, where these are hospitals, both in the U.S. and in Great Britain, where these hospitals face less potential competition, people with certain kinds of health conditions were substantially more likely to die. And that's a really big deal. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to maybe do kind of rapid answers to some of these, because actually there's some really interesting questions here. And so if it really it's to anyone. So the first would be, um, one person points out, this all sounds great to think about more competition. What about rural areas, where it's just going to be really hard to think about competition carrying the, the way if there's only one hospital or a limited number of providers. And so I'm just curious how, you know, Marty, when you're writing the proposal, how you think about that, or really anyone, or Noah, if you're, if you're thinking of doing enforcement, what if there's just one firm? Yeah, I think quickly, so in some places, competition just isn't possible. It's not just rural areas. Uh, but in rural areas in particular, I think, I think they have their own unique sets of issues, and they're very serious ones. People who live in those areas are having a lot hard times in many ways, not just with healthcare. And we have to think about uh, how to address the issues that they face flexibly and in a cost-effective way. One quick thing to say about that is, is propping up a local hospital uh, 
is in most cases likely not the best way to help the people that live in that area. But we, we have to help them. Just to add one more thing, if you think about um, competition in rural areas just in terms of the hospital as a physical place to get care, you're sort of ignoring um, other ways to get care like telehealth, for example, right. and that comes back to some of the issues you raised about scope of practice and ability to um, provide services in a, in a more flexible setting. So, um, so if you just think about it in hospitals, maybe we need to think about it a little bit more broadly. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with all of that. If you think about some of the advocacy we've been doing, it is about expanding the scope of work, right, in places that maybe the market is not going to dictate that there be a physician or the physician won't be available at the school, right, where you may need that physician. Having the ability of more people to provide for the need um, is really, really important. Um, we're going to scrutinize uh, mergers that lead you to that one hospital in the area situation, right. um, you're going to hear horror stories on the other side. There are going to be really tough, equitable claims about we need this, the hospital is failing, and so forth, and that's something that we encounter. Um, I should just throw this out. Um, this is not an area of, uh, this is an area where competition enforcement can make a huge difference. It's not going to be an area where I think we can do it alone, and I would really love to see, and you see this sometimes, uh, our recent case in Philadelphia with the Pennsylvania State AG. State AGs have a really important role to play here. They're a force multiplier. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes worry when I read editorial pages and like all of the writers are concerned about competition in one part of the economy, and they're neglecting health care, and everyone wants to say, yeah, I'm bringing this case, I'm suing that guy. Um, lots of less famous names, maybe even politically influential names in a local area need a lot of scrutiny from antitrust. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I, no, look, I think it's a really important area of concern and something on which we need to continue to focus. Could, could I want to pick up uh, kind of on this same point, and then I have a different question for you, Paul, which is just, are there any benefits to hospital mergers? I thought that was kind of an amusing question to come across. So, you know, we keep talking about these concerns of these consolidating systems and all that. What's the argument for letting any of them go through? There, there presumably is some reason that we think it's okay for them to merge, or is, it, or is there really not at this point? Well, I think a few things, a few thoughts on that. One, uh, you know, hypothetically, you think about it, well, how could hospital mergers improve matters? Well, they could save costs, right? Uh, they could uh, eliminate or reduce unnecessary duplication. They could potentially increase care coordination. They could provide uh, more resources to invest in certain kinds of things that could help out patients. But now we've had decades of these mergers and we have a lot of evidence. And, and what do we see? We don't see consistent evidence that costs are lower or quality is higher or care is more coordinated or that there's more innovation in terms of organization and, and delivery of care. It doesn't mean there aren't some instances, but across the board, we just don't see it. And now, like I said, we've had about 1,600 hospital mergers over the past 20 or 30 years. What are we waiting for? If the benefits are going to materialize, when are they going to happen? I, I want to, so this is an interesting question. I don't know if it occurred to me was, um, if we're thinking about a regulatory approach, uh, and Paul, you've kind of talked about one, and Marty, you've got this kind of flexible oversight uh, agency talked about it. How do we prevent it from just being a revolving door where it's health industry people kind of coming back and forth and in and out where it effectively gets captured. And so great, we've come up with this other way of trying to bring down costs, but it just gets captured. Yeah, I mean, that's always gonna be a challenge with regulation. And uh, you know, there are situations, particularly say, say Medicare, you know, is Medicare captured? The hospitals get all they want from Medicare? Probably not. And it's because, at least in the, because this is a Medicare issue, they're competing with the rest of the government priorities. Um, they're competing, you know, with whether we're going to need tax increases. Um, but, uh, you know, certificate of need, an example of where that does get captured. And that's what the research has suggested. So it's definitely an issue, and it really, it's really going to have to be thought through of designs that are less, you know, the, the Maryland Commission, regulates hospital rates, was designed in a way that uh, uh, they, they had some distance. They had a lot of authority. Uh, 
back in the 1970s when there was rate setting, it was, uh, they were tough rate setting programs. They weren't captured. Mm. Hospitals saw an opportunity to get rid of them <laughs> once Medicare went to prospective payments. But uh, anyway, it's a great question. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a tough issue, and I, and I think that when we think about any kind of regulatory oversight, even if it's uh, relatively flexible and minimal, like I'm proposing, or it's across the board, we, we have to think about this. One thing uh, we were talking about earlier is that with the massive deregulation that happened in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s, with the exception at least a large part of the healthcare system, we don't no longer have a lot of experience with regulation. And there's been some forgetting of all the problems we had with regulation. So if we're proposing to re-regulate or expand regulation, then we do have to think through carefully and we should be looking back at some of the evidence we have from, from other industries when we had heavier regulation. You know, you know, one thing I would suggest is that if the regulation is simple and transparent, I think that makes it harder to capture. Yeah, yeah. But I, I do think there has been some capture even in, in Medicare, right? How do physician prices get set, right? There's this, this commission that's dominated by certain specialties. That's one example of a certain amount of, of regulatory capture. So I think it's something that we need to pay attention to. So we've got just a couple of minutes left, and I want to ask a, a couple of questions uh, to our last two panelists on kind of more forward-looking things. And in particular, um, Liz, this is something you had mentioned to me earlier that I was very struck by. Is we're thinking about competition a lot. We want, we, which kind of pushes you away from collaboration almost. And yet when we're thinking of value-based care, there's a lot of coordination required. And so how do we balance out kind of new models of care where you need a lot of coordination across players with competition? Well, you know, Noah and I were talking before the panel that we have a regulatory system that, that we need to revisit in a lot of ways and update it and modernize. Um, I mean, you think about some of the, the anti-kickback um, rules that really prohibit um, arrangements, um, value-based and outcome-based payment arrangements. HIPAA, for example, might be protecting things that you uh, don't want to protect and, and, and or maybe where you want more flexibility, but not protecting things that you think it's protecting. So um, I think there's a chance and maybe an opportunity at some point to really revisit our regulatory structure, which was built on a, as everyone calls it, a fee-for-service chassis. Um, and now we're expecting a lot more coordination and collaboration across um, providers, um, a different standard of care, a different way of doing things. And I think we don't have the system that's set up to do that. So um, I think we do need to go back and revisit some of these rules. No, the kind of last question on looking towards the future, one of the things that become more important in any industry, but healthcare and also very much so, is data. And how, how is the FTC thinking about kind of the competition concerns that surround who has the data, who owns the data, how portable is the data, and things like that? That's a good question. We're thinking a lot about it, right? <laughs> and we're thinking deeply. Look, the, as the economy moves toward, I mean, toward is probably already an outdated term for this, deeper into data, where data are endemic, our use of data is endemic throughout the economy, we're always going to be looking at how the treatment of data um, operates within a given market, right? So we're interested in is sitting on a bunch of data a barrier to entry or our contracts that deal with the dealing, how you deal with data barriers to entry. The SureScripts case is actually a really interesting example where you've got health records moving between a variety of different parties, between the PBMs and the prescribers, between the prescribers and the pharmacies and so on. Um, and mechanisms that firms engage in uh, to deal with data uh, can have negative effects. Uh, Anne was mentioning HIPAA before, right? HIPAA touches on a privacy issue, um, and people are very concerned these days about privacy, um, but there are circumstances under which privacy and competition can be at loggerheads, right? Access to data creates a potential privacy issue, but it can also really enhance competition. Um, and as we talk a lot about privacy, one concern that I have is that we overreact and we try to tampen down on what can be some of the most productive, competitive space, um, the sharing of records that can really empower patients, um, speed care. I think of the context of um, either a patient who is sick, who is trying to see their, um, you know, their primary care provider and a bunch of specialists and can't even get straight the same set of 
um, issues that they're facing, right? And maybe they're giving different information to different providers. That can be really bad. Or think about the context of a person dealing with an ailing and elderly parent where you have power of attorney um, and you've got to go through a whole bunch of bureaucratic stuff just to get information from one person to another. That can't be good for patients. It can't be good for competition. I mean, I think that's an area on which we ought to focus. That's great. I think we are out of time. This has been a terrific panel. I think it could go on for a long time. I'm very sorry those of you watching couldn't be in the room here with us because I, I think it's been a great conversation, but I appreciate everyone watching, and I very much appreciate uh, Marty for authoring such a great proposal and for everyone for being on the panel with us. So thanks very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.